Um, I think I see you on the chat. I'm here. Hello. Hello, hello. Thanks so much for joining. Um, yeah, I'm like, it's really great to have you here. Um, yeah, I'm like, it's really great to have you here. Um, I don't know, like over the past like two years, I've been reading a lot about like property in relation to my own work. Um, and so came across Nick Blomley's work first, uh, reading some of his um, writing on property and uh, then heard him speak in a really sort of accessible way about property in uh, like land for what I think it was called a uh, seminar or something that was happening in in Cambridge um, so I thought it was super cool so really great that you can come here today and give a similar sort of introduction crash course in property hopefully you can understand these wider systems um, He's a professor of geography at Simon Fraser University, um, has a long-standing interest in legal geography, um, particularly in relation to property. Um, he's interested in the spatiality of legal practices and relationships mm. and the world-making consequences of such legal geographies. Much of his empirical work concerns the often oppressive effects of legal relations on marginalized and oppressed people. Um, thanks so much, uh, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. It's just awesome to be here. I'm going to try and share my screen. Hopefully, I can do that. Uh, I think that, yeah, that should work. <clears throat> Are you guys seeing that? Are you seeing can't, that? Can't see. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's full screen now. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I have about, what, half an hour, 45, 40 minutes or so? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I, before I begin, I just want to, uh, acknowledge that I am coming to you, uh, well, it's this morning for me, um, uh, from the stolen lands of the Coquitlam and Katesi Indigenous Nations in what is also known as, uh, Canada, um, Vancouver. So I'm on the West coast of Canada. I'm eight hours time, time, time difference away from you guys or nine hours, depending on where you are, or maybe even further. Um, uh, thanks so much, Joe, for inviting me to drop into this uh, this uh, this network. It's a it's a real privilege. Uh, it's also a challenge because I don't I don't know I don't know the network. I don't know you guys. I don't know your commitments. Um, um, so I hope to to learn more in this uh, <clears throat> this dialogue we're having. Um, <clears throat> if uh, <clears throat> if people have uh, have questions or they want to just intervene during my presentation, that's absolutely fine. Uh, if I'm not being clear. Um, this so here's my contact my email down at the bottom bomley at sfu.ca and if people want to contact me uh, for other questions or for resources or whatever then uh, please do that um, so so uh, I just made up this title this morning um, I was so keen to get here that I got here an hour early because um, of the time difference so, so I had time to make up a title and as you can see it's kind of a long string of words uh, and basically it's it's uh, what I'm doing here, I think, is is I'm going to uh, reprise some of the arguments I made, uh, as Joe pointed out, at uh, this workshop. It was called Accessing Land, it was land Justice, I think, was the, the theme. Uh, but I also, because I understand you have an interest in commons and commoning, so I thought I would uh, add some uh, material around that. Um, so it could be that this is really familiar ground to you, um, uh, and if so, I apologize. Uh, or it could be that this is very unfamiliar ground to you, and I'm 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 missing the bar. Um, uh, so I'll do my best, and and hopefully we'll uh, we'll get to a good place. So I want to begin with <coughs> with um, this image. Um, this is from a um, a wonderful graphic essay. It's called So Below. You can find it online. It's free, freely accessible. It's a graphic essay by a cartoonist uh, and graphic artist called Sam Wallman. And um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a phenomenal critique of a visual critique of the colonial and capitalist landed property system, exploring, as he puts it, territorialism and dominion, unquote. And it critiques the idea of private property and uh, the commodification of land while directing us to its powerful spatial manifestation in, in borders, in uh, zones, spaces of exclusion, and so on. Um, I've just published a, a short book called Territory, 
and uh, Sam was kind enough to share a bunch of his art with me. So that's interspersed. That's the best bit of the book. The book is rubbish, but but the the, the graphic uh, components are uh, I think fantastic because of Sam's work. And it's it, it he makes a really powerful point, an obvious but powerful point. We 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 take up space as as uh, the the image indicates, and we all need quote some room. Um, what he's telling us, of course, is that we are embodied beings who occupy and depend upon space. Access to some room is a precondition for, for human flourishing, for human existence, for human freedom. Uh, the liberty to perform an action requires the availability of a space in which one is free to perform that action. And the, uh, the quote on the right is uh, from a, uh, a legal academic called Jeremy Waldron. He doesn't use words, he doesn't use images, he uses words, but he's saying something broadly similar. Everything that is done has to be done somewhere. No one is free to perform an action unless there is somewhere that they are free to perform it. Um, so we're not free, Waldron and Woolman remind us, unless we have a space in which we are free to perform an action to be. Consequently, there can be no freedom if space is unavailable to us or is regulated in such a way as to make such freedoms impossible. Now, um, space is regulated by many, many uh, powerful institutions, but property and property rules are perhaps the most fundamental. As Waldron puts it, property rules, quote, give us a way of determining in the case of each place who is allowed to be in that place and who is not. Property rules govern access to vital resources and land, of course, is fundamental here. Land is particularly consequential when it comes to human freedom and flourishing. It's not the only resource governed by property by any means, uh, but nevertheless, it's worth talking about. So if we all want to talk about property, the question then becomes, how do we understand property? And the problem with thinking about property is that there are so many profound misconceptions, uh, often deeply ideological misconceptions about what property actually is. The temptation, of course, is to think about property as me and my stuff. If there's a relationship, in other words, it's a very narrow relationship between me and my, my objects or my home or my um, the resources that I govern. Um, but property rules are not just about me and my stuff. By definition, uh, property has to be a set of rules that govern the relations between people, not just people, non-humans as well, but the relations between people in regards to a valued resource. Property rules don't make any sense if there's, if there's only one person interested in a resource. <clears throat> so for example, a private property rule allows somebody, an owner, to determine who may use a resource and under what conditions. They may choose to allow others to access that resource or they may decline access to others. So property in that sense, in a very immediate sense, is about relations between people. Now you can organize those relations in many diverse different ways. And one fundamental point here again, is that private property is only one way of organizing property relations. There's a default to move from property to private property, but that misses a whole other set of ways of thinking about property, including what we might call common property. Now, property matters. It matters in a profound sense because we're all entangled in it, whether we like it or not. This is a quote um, <clears throat> on the screen from a, a very learned um, legal text on land law, English land law, and uh, Gray and Gray point out that there is no moment in any day in which we stand beyond land law or property laws pervasive reach. No matter what we are doing, property has something to say to us because it shapes who we are, our dural status, uh, whether we're owners or tenants or whatever. Uh, so th the point here is that is that to access space requires relations to others. Um, and those relations are shaped by property and property law. And that can be through permissions or contracts like a lease, uh, a rental apartment, for example. It can also occur through the forced compliance of others, as in the case of uh, settler relations, colonial relations, the relations that I have to the Kwikwetlam and Katesi First Nations, as I described at the outset. 
So for better or for worse, whether we're workers, whether we're indigenous persons, whether we're tenants, whether we're homeowners, whether we're houseless people, we are all entangled within property. But of course, entangled within those relations in very, very different ways. And property structures relations of vulnerability and privilege um, in which certain people's interests are held up while others are marginalized and others are made more precarious and more precarity, more pre have to experience heightened precarity as a consequence. So that's why property is so important. You can't escape it. Um, uh, moreover, the way in which it's structured, of course, becomes of profound importance for questions of social justice and human freedom more generally. Now, in that um, property rule structure relations between people, property necessarily is grounded on helps create forms of social power. So property and power go together in all sorts of entangled and complicated ways. When we, when we well, or when a society <laughs> organizes and distributes property rights, it allocates and enforces social privileges, uh, social vulnerabilities, access to some, denial to others. Now, this is a quote from uh, Laura Undercuffler, property rights, she argues, are collective, enforced, even violent decisions about who shall enjoy the privileges and resources which this society allocates among its citizens. <clears throat> Again, that can be for better or for worse. You can structure property in ways that are remarkably inclusive, um, but you can also structure a property, and this has been the ten tendency, of course, under capitalism and colonialism, you can structure it in ways that are necessarily exclusionary uh, and constraining and limited. So property relations are not inherently exclusionary, right? property can be a site for social inclusion, but private property in particular grants some individual entity, the owner, a, an enforceable veto, an enforceable monopoly when it comes to structuring relations between others. And again, private property is not about the owner and their thing, rather it's about the owner, their thing, and their, the way in which property law structures access and relations vis-a-vis -vis others. This is a quote from a long time ago from a guy called Max Cohen, who was a legal realist, an American legal scholar. <clears throat> um, and he, he wanted to um, open our eyes to some of to the this property power dimension um, in a very immediate sense. If somebody else wants to use the things that the law calls my own, they have to get my consent under a set of property private property rules. To the extent that these things are necessary to the life of my my neighbour, the law thus confers on me a power limited but real to make them do what I want. Dominion over things, rule over objects, is also rule over our fellow human beings. And the ability, of course, to exercise imperium via dominion is not random, it's socially structured and organized. It uh, is the, the fundamental architecture that makes possible things like capitalism, colonialism, and other regimes of social power. Now, property too quickly appears as a sort of set of obvious social facts. Um, I teach a class in property to senior undergraduate students, and basically half the class is uh, focused on unthinking property. Before we can unthink, before we can actually think about property, we have to unthink it. We have to unthink the way it's configured. For example, the notion that property is private property, the notion that property is a set of relations between things such that one can talk about my property. These are all things that have to be unthought. Take private property, for example, there's an assumption that private property has always been with us, that it's some sort of natural, um, uh, in, natural uh, social, transcendental social fact. But this is not true. Private property in uh, at least the, um, the English common law system or the Western legal system is actually a, a modern idea in many, many ways. The idea of private property as a form of absolute dominion was conceptually unavailable in English law and English practice until the early modern era. It was only then through a process of social struggle that the idea of a singular owner set apart from others became hegemonic. So property isn't predetermined. It has and can be organized 
in many ways. And private property is just one contingent way, historically contingent way of organizing uh, property relations. <clears throat> Similarly, the idea of property as a, as a sort of space of private exclusion is also a very modern idea. The idea that people can have control over parcels of land from uh, individual control over parcels of land from which everyone else is to be excluded unless they are granted access by the owner is also a very, very modern idea. The quote here is from a, uh, an historian describing uh, the, uh, the way in which land would have been understood in a, um, in a pre-modern English context or European context. <clears throat> the point being that in any parcel of land, in any field, for example, we would not just be talking about one owner. Many others would take some of the produce from that field or simply make their way across it on the way to somewhere else. The image of one individual owner excluding all others and taking all increase, all wealth from a parcel of land would have been a vast over simplification. It's only by the 17th century and the emergence of enclosure that property begins to be reimagined by an emergent social class um, that as a real as a as a as a as, a, as an abstract space from which others are to be excluded uh, that we begin to see this idea uh, being pushed forward now enclosure enclosure of land which we can talk about if you like also entails the enclosure of the mind <clears throat> it's a it's a mental project an ideological project as much as it is a practical project um, on the land because fundamentally it also entails the denial or the erasure of forms of property that depart from private property private property property becomes property uh, through this process of enclosure and other modalities of property fundamentally that which enclosure enclosure uh, destroyed um, are denied denigrated neglected and overlooked and that's a familiar thread so the idea of common property for example is something that um, orthodox observers uh, uh, disregard they regard it as as, as a as an aberration, as a, a medieval relic, uh, as something um, that is cannot be property, in fact. But when we're talking about common property, uh, we are talking about actually a highly systematized, deeply, um, uh, carefully organized set of uh, ways of organizing property relations that depart from uh, a simple notion of private property. So to talk about common property is to talk about ownership or access by a group of identifiable individuals, such that one can talk about resources being held, quote, in common. And those commoners, we can call them, have rights by virtue of being in a commons, both collective and individual, uh, to use those resources. And those resources uh, historically could be land, but they don't have to be. They can also be culture, they can be ideas, um, they can be water, uh, they can take many forms. Now, there are dimensions of exclusion to common property, because if it's a group, we're talking about, to some extent, excluding outsiders, those who are perceived to be a threat to the commons. Uh, but if you're an insider, if you're a commoner, by definition, you have the right not to be excluded. You have the right of access that comes from membership in that commons. Commons are not free-for-alls by any means. Commons entail the creation of carefully calibrated and collectively negotiated rules governing use and access. The, the classic English rural commons uh, entailed very, very careful calibration of how many sheep could be put or cows could be put on the pasture, uh, for example. This is a system predicated not on monetization, but rather on self-sustaining on maintenance on maintaining ongoing relations over uh, a very extended period of time uh, what some call a seven generations ethic of care so alienability commodification um, are in general threats to that system because of course they undercut that if you sell off all your land there is no commons upon which to work <clears throat> and it's a system that is focused on meeting human needs in a very immediate sense, on provisioning, on providing enough to sustain yourself in a, not just in a minimalist way, but in a, in a socially productive and ongoing uh, way. 
Now, there's a book <coughs> by uh, Gibson Graham and others called Take Back the Economy, an ethical guide for transforming our community communities that came, uh, came out a couple of years ago, and I'd recommend it to you, uh, because in, in there they talk a lot about commons, and one of the points they want to make is that commons are not some archaic uh, relic of the past, rather they're actually something that uh, we can find happening in our societies uh, right now. They define commons as a property, a practice, or a knowledge that is shared by a community. Uh, and they point to the, uh, the uh, certain dimensions of uh, the commons, to access, use, benefit, care, and responsibility uh, as taking particular forms under uh, the commons. <clears throat> so we can think of commons as happening in many, many contexts. Um, it's not just, again, some uh, medieval relic. Uh, we can see it in uh, contemporary uh, spaces and practices, the allotment garden or the community garden uh, is one example. I'm a member of a community choir, uh, and that community choir is a sort of a commons. Um, access is shared and wide, use is negotiated by the members of that community, um, care is performed by community members, the resource in this case is culture, is, uh, is art uh, rather than land, but nevertheless we can think of that I think also as a sort of commons. Gibson Graham <clears throat> also argue that we depend upon a host of what we might call meta commons, social commons, biophysical, cultural, social, knowledge based, that are continually made and remade through human action, continually drawn down upon and replenished, continually maintained, but also degraded. <clears throat> the commons is also made, not found. And this to me is a a fundamental point. The temptation, when we're looking for commons, I think, we tend to, to look for particular spaces that are collectively owned, um, uh, like the allotment or the community garden. But if we move away from a sort of noun-centered view of the commons and think rather more uh, in a rather more useful frame, think about the, the practices that actually make commons happen, uh, when we start thinking about commoning rather than simply the commons, as Peter Linebaugh puts it, then uh, I think we can find commoning commons happening all around us. So commoning really is the practice of maintaining the commons. It's that hard relational work of negotiating access, use, care, membership, and so on. Who gets to be in the community choir? Um, how are we going to... Um, share uh, how we're going to do the the collective labor that the allotment needs to have uh, in order for it to be realized what are the rules who gets to be a member um, and under what conditions might somebody be expelled from uh, a commons commoning gibson graham put it claims resources for a collective or a community of more than one it involves defining who is the we that establishes protocols for sharing access and use uh, as well as shouldering its care and how benefits are to be distributed. And when we think about commoning rather than commons, I think we get to a, a more interesting space because commoning can be happening in multiple settings. We can find commoning happening in private property. We can find commoning happening on state property, uh, for example, a, a social movement that organizes a protest or an occupation in a city park. That park is owned by the municipality, yet the practices of, uh, of, of solidarity and support that the people engaged in that protest are engaged in is a form of commoning. So if we look only at who owns the land, we're going to miss this, I think, important dimension to, to commons and commoning. Now, this is Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, she's the only woman who won, who's won a Nobel Prize in economics. And she did so for uh, some really important, very, very empirical work. Um, she, isn't, um, she isn't a radical by any means. She's, uh, she, she is a very, um, she's an economist who does very detailed, did, she's passed away, unfortunately. She did very, very detailed work, empirical work. And what her goal was, essentially, was to ref refute this myth um, of the so-called tragedy of the commons. Um, and in her work, what she does is document through careful, careful um, uh, uh, research, the, um, the pervasiveness of forms of social systems um, that, as she puts it, resemble neither the state nor the market, 
but govern resource systems with remarkable or reasonable degrees of success over long periods of time. Um, there's evidence, abundant evidence uh, of, uh, of commoning, in other words, happening in regards to, to resource use. She looks, for example, at fisheries, things like this. And what, again, comes from her work, I think, which is useful, is that commons are not just a resource, they're a self-organized social system. They, they bring together a resource, a community, and a set of social practices, commoning. They're not happy, clappy systems for sharing and collaboration. They're carefully calibrated systems for organizing collective access to and management of a vital resource. Now, why might people engage with commons? Um, the presumption when it comes to property is that people's engagement with property is self-regarding, it's self-interested. And in fact, you can find scholarship saying that people who have, uh, who are motivated by self-interest self may in some cases find commons and commoning the most efficient, the most productive way of realizing those interests, particularly when we're talking about resources that are characterized by so-called non-excludability and rivalry. In other words, um, uh, you can't, it's very hard to kick people off or grant, deny people access to a resource, uh, but also anyone who access that resource draws down that resource. So it becomes a zero sum game. So an inshore fishery, for example, is a resource characterized by non-excludability and rivalry. And when you look at inshore fisheries, uh, you very often find, in fact, that people uh, who are motivated by self-regarding behavior uh, organize themselves through a form of commoning. It's actually much more productive for everyone in the long term, uh, even if they're self-regarding, to organize some collective form of access. But people also, of course, engage with resources through other, with other motivations, particularly other regarding uh, behavior. And Gibson Graham and others note the uh, the seven generations ethic of care, this ethic of care centered on a responsibility to make resource decisions that will not disadvantage future generations. Uh, a guy called David Bollier, who's uh, written quite a lot on commons in a very accessible way, talks about the, the importance of what he calls the gift economy. A gift economy uh, is, uh, is a system not based on cash exchange, uh, not based on a zero sum relationship, uh, not based simply on self interest, but rather uh, on the desire to create and sustain relationships within a group of people uh, who share common commitments and common, uh, common interests. And the more people who actively engage in those resources, like, for example, open access software, the better it becomes for all. And Ostrom defines this as a so called non subtractive relationship. So people, for example, go on to social media in a way because they're motivated by what we might call the gift economy. They want to share pictures of their grandchildren and in return they want to see other people's grandchildren's or videos of cats or whatever it might be. Uh, so in that sense, social media, in terms of the motivations of those who engage with it, can to some extent be thought of as a form of other regarding behaviour. <clears throat> However, <laughs> because of the centrality of private property, because of the dominance of a certain framing of property, the commons is all too often misunderstood, marginalized, or dismissed. Um, and our, our language, the very language we use, the language of resources, uh, for example, makes them hard to see. They become obscured. Commons also, of course, constantly face enclosure. Enclosure is the process by which a collective system of resource use becomes privatized, becomes held by an individual, um, a corporation, uh, for example. And the, the logic for this is very straightforward. Enclosure entails the expropriation of the incredible value that's being generated within the gift economy of the commons. So Elon Musk wants to buy Twitter or Facebook wants to regulate people's cat videos because they want to expropriate and extract that value, the value that's being produced through those everyday social interactions. Define this, and I'm going to be done now, this is my last slide, commons and commoning are remarkably pervasive. We can see them at work in multiple scales, micro and macro, and in multiple 
settings. Human societies across the world have commoned for thousands of years. Most of your ancestors, I'm sure, uh, were commoners. Millions, billions of people continue to do so. It's estimated that there are about 2 billion subsistence commoners globally. <clears throat> Historically, most of us were commoners, but also we still are in many ways. I think this is an important point. Commons and commoning serve as a focus for, for new forms of activism and engagement, as well as drawing from long-standing, very ancient forms of social practice. They can be highly efficient solutions to particularly knotty challenges relating to resource use, like, for example, fishery in a uh, access to fishery in a, um, uh, a coastal village. They can be incredibly creative and resilient. They're not necessarily conservative and static. They innovate, they change. They can be value generating, although the value is not necessarily value that is immediately monetized, although there are those who would like to monetize those that value. They entail innovative, bottom-up forms of experimentation tied to local needs and local experience. And they can be essential, arguably, to human well-being, human survival, and human flourishing. <clears throat> and I will stop there. Thank you very much for your interest. Great, thanks so much. And is it only going to hear me like clapping though? So like, yeah, thanks. That was really good. Um, particularly um, when you're finishing, like describing the different types of commons that um, that have. Um, sorry, I just got a text from the next next person. Um, that there are emer like emerging um, for people to kind of get sort of some sort of idea of like the different strands that that we can take projects within this. Um, uh, yeah, and um, yeah, but I was particularly thinking about like examples in um, in Sheffield um, of of collective resources or well, commons that have been attempted to be enclosed or like. I, maybe we'll hear from some people later about like uh, the when there's a sort of shared resource that's that's proven like they they create uh, something that's socially valuable and then that sort of gets a uh, monetary value, then that seems like something that can be uh, exploited and enclosed by different private entities uh, that come in, <laughs> swoop in. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good <clears throat> that's a good point. And that struggle between uh, around enclosure um, and resistance from the commoners has been has been ongoing. Uh, so so there's a story of enclosure that's important, but there's a story of resistance to enclosure um, uh, of commoners pushing back and continuing to uh, to push back um, over this process of the expropriation of of the value that's generated in the commons. Commons are protected by commoners because. For many reasons, because they they work, because they sustain people, um, uh, because they uh, so historically because they allowed people to be self sufficient. Um, when the rural enclosure happened, people no longer become self sufficient. They have to go to Manchester or to Sheffield and uh, to work in the mills uh, and uh, to give their, to sell their labour to, uh, to 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 private property owners rather than being able to use their own labour. Um, in relations with others to uh, to generate the value that sustained them and their families for for generations. So it's a, it's an important when we talk about enclosure, we always have to talk about the resistance to uh, to to, uh, to to enclosure because I think that's that's fundamental. Yeah, super interesting. Um, yeah, as, uh, well, if anyone has any questions, please just like raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll just like continue talking as I am um, want to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, like particularly like what was really um, like eye opening for me in my understanding of property was not like not understanding it as this like monolithic thing that exists, but like in terms of like contracts of like the number of rights that you're given over a place. And so like, for example, when you get the deeds to a house, you get like certain rights that you have over that space. And then as a as a renter like interacting yeah. with that the the um the rights that are given over to me temporarily because i i pay for pay for them um so like yeah to understand the world around us in that way um then allows you to like work out ways of ways around it and the little bits that you can change yeah i think that's 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 really important i mean uh 
there's a temptation, I think, to think about that partly because we think about property as private property, to think about you know private property as 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 a creating insiders and outsiders. There are owners who own everything, and then there's everyone else who doesn't act, doesn't own anything. They're workers and they're tenants and so on. And that's that's mis that's correct insofar as the power relation is clearly at play there because people who who are private property owners have been granted more powers. Um, they don't they don't it's not theirs. It's been granted to them by by the state. Um, but but the tenant, the worker, they're also entangled in property and they're caught up in those property relations. Uh, but that, that's not to say that this is a horizontal relationship by, by any means. It's, it's we, to think relationally, to think carefully about those social relations, to think about the way in which they're framed and constituted. Uh, and in particular, to think about the way in which they generate uh, precarity. Um, I have a paper a couple of years ago that tried to kind of trace this through and think about the notion of precarious property, uh, recognizing that most people uh, are highly precarious in terms of the relationship they have to uh, to dominant others who who extract wealth and value by virtue of the uh, the property relations that they've been uh, they've been granted by uh, by a colonial uh, capitalist um, system. Yeah, I think like as well. I think about the, that relationship between um, well, like groups that we've been talking to in Sheffield who are like yeah like in precarious positions because they don't own the the building that they operate out of um and maybe that's okay for some some groups who are like more like light on their feet and actually like enjoy like inhabiting different spaces over time but then like if it's something that that is a is a cornerstone of a, like a specific community group in a location then like the not having the autonomy to be able to like control your yeah your own yeah. property is like um yeah a real issue and something easily exploited yeah you don't you don't but you don't have to be a pr private property owner to have a space of autonomy and relative freedom uh although it's going to be relatively conditional given the dominance of those property yeah. relations so i'm not advocating everyone to become private property owners by by any means um but but recognizing those uh, recognizing sometimes the kind of the the particular work that property does in structuring relations of privilege and uh, dependency is, is important. And there's actually lots of important political work that happens in those spaces. So tenant organizing, for example, is very much about understanding the specificities of the law um, that empowers evictions, for example, uh, and, and then denies evictions under certain conditions, right? So uh, landlords do not have universal power to, uh, to, 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 to evict, despite what they may, they may think. So there's space in there sometimes for a kind of creative political resistance and uh, and struggle hmm. yeah um thanks so much like if anyone does have anything to say like just just say it oh kitty go ahead hi um i was just thinking i just wanted to comment on the point you made about commons having rules and regulations and the people who all share the the property um, or the the ownership, the people who collectively use the resource of that space or property <clears throat> have to um, self-organize and then it, it can, in theory, become exclusionary because they have to make the rules about who's who becomes a part of this group. Right. Which I think is I think is interesting because it's not yeah. it's not it's not a free for all, basically, <laughs> which I think is the <laughs> scary. <laughs> well, that's yeah, that, I mean. You could you could make it a free for all if you like, but but that's probably not going to work very well. So so that's the tragedy of the commons, the myth of the tragedy of the commons um, uh, that uh, maybe some people have heard have heard about. Uh, Garrett Hardin, who was a was actually a racist and a nasty piece of work, um, he actually was talking about an open access system where anybody could access that system at any time uh, without recognizing the actual rules that people construct to regulate to regulate access. Um, so, so under certain, so under certain circumstances, yeah, um, exclusion is necessary. Um, so, um, if you're organizing tenants, you probably want to exclude um, landlords, for, for example. Um, uh, if you have a, you know, you're organizing a community garden, then not everybody gets to use that space, um, or they can access that space, but they don't, they don't become a commoner perhaps. So, mm -hmm. so you can negotiate, you know, people are welcome to come into that community garden, but you can't take people's vegetables. Um, and you can't just stop gardening there, you need to go through the process of joining, joining the commons. 
Um, so yeah, yeah. There, there, there is, there, it's an important dynamic uh, that needs to be, uh, to be thought through. Thank you. Yeah, I think definitely like, it's a lot, <laughs> hopefully like understanding these things now for everyone who's sort of like in, I don't know, being introduced to ideas of like thinking about thinking about property in general and thinking about commons um not only as like just shared spaces but with these frameworks around them like i think it was really good to to get that first understanding of that um and we'll obviously have this recorded as well if you want to go back over at anyone and like refresh your memory in the coming months uh so yeah thanks Thanks so much, Nick. Um, it was brilliant. Um, thanks so much for waking up and like joining yeah. from Canada. <laughs> um, oh, it would be. Oh, hang on, a little question coming in. Okay, um, I see it. Between the Commons and the community. Yeah, it would be interesting for us if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the Commons and the community. Yeah, that's. Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, um, uh, so they are overlapping, but not necessarily the same. So commons, by definition, entails a collective, uh, entails more than one, entails a group. Um, um, it, it, you can't have a an in, you know a singular uh, commoner. Um, but but community, I think, usually takes us beyond the commons as a as a self organizing system. Um, to include potentially much larger kind of networks of of people, so I would think of them as overlapping, but not necessarily not necessarily the same. Um, uh, particularly for commons requires homogeneity. Um, I don't think commons no commons doesn't require homogeneity. Um, uh, I, I, people, it, it's, it's not necessarily um, uh, some sort of um, Political project in which everyone has to wear the same clothes and uh, <laughs> do the same thing. Um, uh, you, commons, commons can entail people who are very different. My my community choir, for example, uh, is no by no means homogenous. Um, there are people who come into that who are very politically very different. Uh, there are young people. There are old people. Um, but but they all have uh, there's conformity in so far as there's a shared set of understandings about how this commons is going to work. Um, uh, and people are coming into that for very different reasons. Somebody may want to join that choir because God help them, they want to learn how to sing. Um, not a very good space actually, given that our choir is not very good at singing, but we try very hard. Uh, so, so there's gonna be diversity in that, in that system. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not just about uh, creating sameness. I think that's a, that's a, that's a misunderstanding. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay. Um, brilliant. Well, 